And thanks everyone here for coming and joining and listening. And thank you especially to Jane Simpson for being my PhD supervisor and being my entree into linguistics and being actually the best supervisor I could possibly imagine. Yeah, yeah. Really? Like, I think she's probably among the best. Um, so the study I'm talking about today is not exactly the kind of study that Jane does, but what I really love about Jane as a supervisor and a mentor is that she was just so deeply encouraging and supportive of what I wanted to do and the paths I needed to take for my exploration, my intellectual development and my development of relationships with Aboriginal communities and such. She was never trying to get me to do the things that she would have wanted to do or anything like that. She really supported me to, to follow my interests, which I'm doing some of today. So the question in a way is just a very basic one. How do words and morphemes in language end up being arranged the way they are? And there's very popular answers out there along the lines of that there's an underlying hierarchical structure applying at least to words, if not to morphemes. And in many versions, that's also a universal structure. And the answer I'm pursuing today is a different kind of answer where that arrangement of words and morphemes uh, emerges from the interaction of cognitive and communicative processes. <clears throat> so Jane Simpson has had a few things to say about this. Indeed, one of her greatest and very widely cited papers, Simpson and Withgott, 1986, Pronominal Clitic Clusters. If you have not read it, you should definitely read it. Uh, in this paper, she shows that phenomena involving phenomenal clitics, actually a range of types of clitics, really don't seem to fit well with the prevailing models of hierarchical phrase structure and instead look more like linear sequences, linear schemas. I'm going to talk about schematic slots, which are occupied by the range of things belonging to a grammatical category such as we see here for Walbury, the auxiliary uh, linear schema. Now, as part of these proposals for these linear schemas, which they actually mostly call templates, um, a key part of it was really about idiosyncratic stuff. Idiosyncratic meaning with specific morphine allomorphs and particular morphine <laughs> combinations, like the way in Warramunga, there's just different forms of the second plural object depending on what the subject is that it co-occurs with. So a lot of the emphasis was on these idiosyncratic combinations and schemas, but I'm gonna propose linear schemas should think bigger than that. They don't just need to hang out in the idiosyncratic margins. We can have linear schemas as principled models of morphosyntactic structure. Because following on from some of that stuff about templatic morphology, it ties in with a bunch of stuff, but there's an overall tendency to look at hierarchical structure, to see hierarchical structure as being the motivated principled form of linguistic analysis. Whereas linear, uh, linear arrangements tend to be associated with being stipulative and language specific. And you often come across slogans like structures, not streams where the real stuff of syntactic analysis is supposed to should be hierarchical structures and strings are seen as something relatively uh, superficial. Mm -hmm. But I'm not, I'm not going with that. I think we can instead have linear schemas that are very much principled and motivated. So I'm going to do a little case study looking at the humble noun phrase, which is widely proposed to have a hierarchical structure on the line. So we can see here there's these different levels and subgroupings of syntactic nodes. And so the real fascinating fact is this underlying hierarchical structure. And then you have the range of possible linear, uh, you know, uh, linear spell outs, which are almost sort of epiphenomenal. And here are some of those linear spell outs. 
So if we just take these four elements, the determiner, the number, the adjective, and the noun, there are 24 different ways you can arrange them in a linear, linear output. But of those 24 ways, as is widely known in many, many studies, there's actually eight of them which occur very frequently. And what's nice is that those eight have a certain pattern which is encapsulated here, whereby the adjective is always at least the equal closest to the noun. And then the number is never is not closer than the adjective, and the demonstrative is not closer than the number. All right. But then you can flip in terms of linear ordering, you can flip everything each way as long as it obeys that general hierarchy. <clears throat> and if you follow those principles, you get these eight orderings, which are very widespread compared to the other 16 orderings that are relatively rare. Now, this paper came out in 2020, Culbertson et al which blew my little mind like that guy down there, because in this paper, they looked at corpus uh, statistics of these grammatical categories, number, adjective, noun, demonstrative. And they found a very strong pattern, which is basically can be called interpredictability. It is that in terms of uh, corpus discourse tokens of noun phrases, if you measure things in terms of mutual information, which is just like how predictably things occur together, nouns and adjectives occur the most predictably in particular combinations, whereas numbers are less predictable in how they co-occur with how they combine with nouns and determinants, demonstratives, sorry, I'm switching between the two, are the least predictable. And they talk about this in terms of uh, the properties of the world, like the fact that Dalmatians uh, have this permanent inherent property of being spotted. So therefore, the adjective spotted and the noun Dalmatian are more predictably occur together. Compared to, say, determiners, which, uh, you know, have no particular inherent relationship to the noun they're being attached to, right? So you can just flip back and forth between determinants and determiners. And so this matches these orderings we find in languages of the world. You would be familiar with this order, say, from the language Ket, or this language, which you're familiar with from Thai. And they showed when they measured interpredictability, measured as mutual information, corpora of 24 languages, every single language had the same hierarchy, where basically the highest interpredictability was indeed between the adjective and the noun. And always less than that was between number and noun, and the term and noun is the least interpredictability. It also works between different classes of adjectives, where the, you know, the way some types of adjectives are closer to the noun than others. Again, it lines up beautifully with interpredictability measured as mutual information. So this is pretty cool. There's some fascinating connection between interpredictability and the arrangement of elements in noun phrases. Why would that be? Um, they have their answers, which uh, basically they still accept that there is a hierarchical underlying arrangement of syntactic nodes, but they observe that that, uh, that matches up with interpredictability. And I think their general story is that we kind of build this underlying structure in a way that reflects the interpredictability of our experiences of the world, but there's still this underlying hierarchical structure. What I'm doing today is talking about a model of how you get from that interpredictability to the linear orders. And in this model, there is no underlying hierarchical structure. You go straight from interpredictability, more or less, to linear schemas. More like what James Simpson proposed. And by the way, I, it's not that I claim that nothing is hierarchical in language. I think other stuff like relative clause and stuff very likely is. But I think for things like noun phrases, I don't think there's that strong justification for an underlying hierarchical structure. So how we're going to get there is, I said it's going to be a very principled way of developing linear schemas. And it's based on, you need three principles to build the model. And I think they're all very well attested solid principles. One is that uh, we have some mechanism by which 
we so we store and retrieve linguistic symbols, right, in some kind of mental lexicon or whatever you want to call it. Um, and as part of that mechanism, complex symbols can be stored, and that storage is largely driven by interpredictability. You will store what you've, you've got multiple primitive symbols, but you sometimes just store them together as a complex symbol, and you will do that if they're more interpredictable. Second principle, then the next two principles is with linear transmission of messages. One of them is that when you output a message, complex symbols should be contiguous in the linear output. And the third principle is that when we output uh, messages, we tend to reuse the same grammatical category orders. So I'm just going to tell, talk about a, <laughs> It's exactly three hours from the first time. So, two hours from I'm going to show you a preliminary um, kind of uh, computational model of this, an implementation of those three principles. And this is something I've been working on with Charles Kemp, a colleague at the University of Melbourne. But as you can see, it's pretty dinky at the moment, right? Which is, this is just like the preliminary version. I hope we can get that up. I'm going to hold back because I don't think I can explain things very well without talking. See, you needed to see this picture of a computer, right? <laughs> Computational model, that's it. Okay. So it's a preliminary implementation, and I just want to caveat we're just working with a toy input data set where we basically just develop these messages which all have a set of four primitive symbols, a noun, an adjective, a number, and a determiner. And uh, we just built a toy data set, which all it does is it captures these kind of distributions whereby the nouns and the adjectives deliberately have the highest amount of uh, mutual information in the data set. And we do that by having combinations like dogs and brown and cats and black. We deliberately make them extra frequent in particular combinations. And then the next most uh, highest mutual information we make between the nouns and the numbers by throwing in a few kind of high frequency things like four wheels, and then the, the demonstratives have hardly any mutual information. Okay, so we make this toy data set. And then what we do is the first stage involves building this, this storage system where you can store either simple or complex symbols. And it's a stochastic process of symbol storage which we're, we call chonking because it's a bit like some psycholinguistic stuff but i don't know if it's supposed to be exactly the same as those and so it's the tap where it, it, uh, the system is exposed to lots of symbols and occur occurring in uh, kind of linguistic experiences and it will stochastically choose to do things like put cats and black together based on its observations of those having higher mutual information and it can do this recursively and build complex symbols that have within them a complex symbol and that kind of thing. So there is actually some recursiveness in the model, but it's actually recursiveness in uh, lexical storage of complex symbols. All right, and that uses mutual information. And what that does is it means that then to convey one of those messages, instead of having four symbols every time you need to retrieve the, the, the symbols, Sometimes, if you've got a complex symbol, you don't need to retrieve three. You, may, you don't need to retrieve four. You may only need to retrieve three or two because one is a complex symbol. And that gives you these advantages, these economies, where instead of having four symbols per message, you start to get to three or less symbols per message. But it's important that you do that chunking using the mutual information because if you just do random chunking, then you can have tons and tons of these complex symbols being stored. You want the complex symbols to just be the useful targeted ones based on the mutual information. This is a kind of optimality figure where you want to be in this quadrant down here. Then you get to the linear transmission based on this storage. So again, this is a stochastic process. So stored content like this is then being output into linear uh, messages. 
and uh, it starts off with no particular ordering. So it's a kind of an iterative um, implementation where at the beginning, any of the 24 possibilities is equally probable, but what it does is over time, it begins to converge on particular linear orderings. And the first of those linearization uh, uh, principles is that if there is a complex symbol, it, the preference is for that to be contiguous. So if black, if caps black is part of a complex symbol, then you want those to be next to each other, like these ones. You don't want them to be non-contiguous. You would think maybe we'd put that as like a categorical rule rather than a preference. But I think in language, it actually does seem like more like a preference because you can say like fan fucking tastic, right? So you can actually <laughs> break up symbols and make them non-contiguous. But also making a, a gradient thing means we can show how the system behaves as you like turn the gradient up or down. And then the second part of linearization uh, is the more iterative thing where each time you linearize a message, let's say you chose this one, you chose this linearization, that then kind of boosts the probability of that grammatical category order for subsequent messages. So these two principles uh, just to, right, so I'm going to start by showing you that those two principles together do produce the same kinds of noun phrase ordering as what we find in natural languages. So those 24, of, this is 20 iterations of the system, and in each iteration, it gradually converges towards uh, noun phrase ordering. And out of 20 iterations, 17 times, it converges on one of those eight typologically preferred orderings. It doesn't work every time. Three times out of 20, it did it converged on a typologically dispreferred order. But that's actually the same as natural languages because those typologically preferred orders are attested in 83% of languages. So it doesn't always happen. And then how we can see these two principles interacting is you need both the principles to be in the model to get the natural language-like orderings. If you don't have the contiguity parameter, if, the, if that's at zero or too weak, then you get all kinds of typologically dispreferred orderings from that all the time. And if you don't have the consistency parameter, then uh, too much of the time, uh, I can't explain right now. <laughs> Too much of the time, it won't get there either. And actually, you can't have too much of the consistency parameter as well, um, for reasons that I also won't go into. But there's this whole thing which I call the sweet region, where if both the parameters are in force and you don't have too much of the consistency parameter, then you end up with similar word orders as what we find in natural languages. And one thing I like about the system is it is a stochastic variable system. So I talk about it converging on particular linear schemas. So the status of the linear schema in this whole system is it's just basically a stochastic probability that becomes more probable over time. And if you push that consistency parameter and run the implementation long enough, eventually it will become categorical on one particular word order. But also a lot of the implementations are non-categorical they leave some variability in the ordering of the elements of a noun phrase. And that also is like natural languages because I, I can't find any typological study of that, but lots of natural languages, I'm convinced, have some variability in noun phrase ordering. And my three minutes of use of the Google, the corpus of Google show that. So if you think about combinations in English, so we've got the adjective closest to the noun and then the number further away, right? But if you think about combinations that are likely to have high mutual information, like four and wheels, you do actually find variation where sometimes you get this abnormal um, noun phrase order. So that's all we've got time for today, pretty much. In summary, uh, this system, although it's quite dinky and in many ways not like real language, it shows that those same kind of noun phrase orderings as a typologically preferred in natural languages can be generated by a fairly simple comp computational implementation, which basically just has three principles running it. And I think that all those principles are pretty reasonable based on all sorts of uh, 
linguistic evidence. And you can therefore get these natural language like orderings without needing to have a kind of underlying hierarchical structure. In fact, it doesn't have any fixed structure. Um, and there's big limitations. The, probably the worst one is at the moment, it's just working with a toy data set, but we want to plug in actual corpus data. Uh, it, we kind of ignore there's a slight little weirdness that we've also got a suffix on the end, which has agreement with the number. And also, it's very unlike real natural language because it doesn't have any actual agents who communicate and perceive and produce. It's just like one monolithic system. So, yeah, all kinds of stuff still to do. But thanks again to Jane for uh, giving me the support and encouragement to become my linguist. <laughs>